So how can we model mutualisms? We need to consider the effect of one species on the other and vice versa. Here we can see a bumblebee pollinating flowers of the alligator flag. These have a cool mechanism that grabs the bee around the neck and in wriggling out it gets the pollen on itself and transfers pollen to the stigma. So the Latka-Volterra model was modified for mutualism by Gauss and Witt and rediscovered many times. There were two two species models of obligate mutualism, N1 and N2. The, for each species, the intraspecific competition term reduced the population size, but then the benefit term, A12, the effect of species 2 on species 1, modified by the density of species 2, and here the other way for species 2 benefiting from the presence of species 1. This looked like a good idea, but it had an unrealistic result of populations growing without bound in what has been called an orgy of mutual benefaction. When you look at the phase plane graphs of this, you can see that the species interacting would increase to unlimited numbers and there are some modifications that obligate mutualisms make things tighter or you know more um, equilibrium but the facultative mutualisms could lead to huge numbers of both species an unrealistic outcome however if you consider that the per capita Per additional individual of mutualist species benefit decreases with increasing recipient density or increasing benefactor density, you get a balancing result that mutualism can't override all of the density dependent regulation, competition, etc. So this stabilizes the model. There are other models that are interesting and I wanted to tell you about some of them. Joan Roughgarden, actually when she was Jonathan Roughgarden in 1975, came up with one, and Kathy Keeler in 1981, where the fitness costs and benefits were estimated and compared. They said you needed to define conditions under which mutualism is favored, where benefits are greater than the costs. A successful mutualist both assists and receives benefit. An unsuccessful mutualist assists but doesn't receive a benefit. And non-mutualists don't interact. They neither assist nor receive. So look at this model system of plants with ant dispersed seeds. These two plants, on the upper left we have bloodroot, sanguinaria, and on the bottom bleeding hearts. And like many temperate zone spring herbs, they have seeds that have arils on them, or eliasomes they're called. Here the brown part is the seed, but here's the lipid-rich eliasome, and here the ant is pulling it by this seed, by its eliasome. So ants will transport these near their nests take the eliasome off and throw the seed away and the seed gets dispersed. So this phenomenon, ants dispersing seeds, is called myrmecochory and a plant that has ant dispersal is a myrmecochore. So W is the symbol usually used for fitness in evolutionary models. P and Q are frequencies of the different types M is the Mermeca core, T transported, and N not. So the fitness of the Mermeca core in this first equation is equal to the proportion or the frequencies of um, those that are transported plus 
the frequencies of those not transported. The frequencies times the fitness of those not transported. In the second equation, the fitness of those not transported is equal to the proportion of seeds surviving times their reproductive success minus the investment in the food body. And because they would have wasted it if they're not transported. And finally, the, the fitness of transported is equal to the percentage of seeds surviving times their reproductive success minus the investment in the food body. So for mutualism to exist, the benefit has to cover the cost of the food body that is, the reproductive success of those transported has to be greater than those not transported. And also, the survival has to be greater for dispersed seeds. In any mutualistic interaction, we can have in individuals or species that take advantage. A third species may invade a good interaction. Maynard Smith proposed the ESS concept that of evolutionarily stable strategies that dealt with this invasibility of interactions, where a cheater is an individual of a partner species that receives the benefits but doesn't reciprocate, thereby economizing. So for cheating to increase, cheaters have to obtain advantage over the non-cheaters, and the main obvious advantage would be cost avoidance. One way of cheating is for potential pollinators to circumvent the difficult way of getting nectar where they touch the flower parts and instead just drill a hole in the bottom of the corolla and take the nectar without doing their pollination job. Here you can see bees doing this dastardly deed, and here you can see the holes that have been made by the robbers in that species. And here's a, a bee too little to visit, too short to get to the nectar, which legitimately you have to go in this way, but he's just going in from the bottom and taking nectar right here. So there's a name in the scientific literature now for these cheaters. They're known as aprovechados, ones who take advantage. And this was coined in a paper by Carlos Martinez del Rio and Sobron Minero. The fitness of cheaters in a nectar-rich environment isn't that different from others. But in a nectar-poor environment, the benefits are much greater. In this diagram are some little um, symbols used by Levins in what is called loop analysis. Each species is symbolized by a circle. An arrow with an arrowhead is a benefit. A line with a solid dot is a negative effect. So we can model simply interactions using these symbols. <clears throat> the first one is that of Batesian mimicry, where there are, where you have A, that could be the Batesian mimic, is acting like an aprovechado. So maybe that's why the A is here. M1 and M2 are Mullerian mimics and mutualists. Their presence benefits the other one. But here's their negative self-effect intraspecific competition. That's what these are. They both benefit the aprovechado, who can take advantage of looking like them. But this one is detrimental to them because if predators eat that, Batesian mimic, they're more likely to eat the Mullerian mimic species. And this can apply also to reproductive mimics in plants, like that Malpighiaceae example with the oil-collecting bees. 
And in the second diagram, you could see how the effect of the second diagram, mutualist one could be a plant, mutualist two, the pollinator, and A could be the nectar robber. So the mute plant and pollinator benefit each other. The plant benefits the aprovechado, but the aprovechado is stealing, so that's negative. And the pollinator takes the reward the aprovechado would take, that's negative, and this one takes the pollinator's reward, negative. So you can have many interactions in an interacting system, competition in mutualistic sy systems, such as pollinators limiting fruit set in plants. Well, actually, that's not competition. That's just a limitation. Or seed dispersers limiting dispersal and establishment of plants. But then plants might compete for pollinators or dispersal agents. This is intra-specific competition among species of the individuals of the same species of plant. Ants might compete for homopterans, mutualists, or aphids for their ant tenders. There could also be competition between species, interspecific competition for mutualists. Encounter competition is a kind we might find for example, the ant mosaic on tropical trees, where ants visit both extrafloral nectaries and homopterans, or honeydew exuding insects, these two may compete with each other for ants. There could be competition among pollinators as well. Hummingbirds and hawk moths for flowers on the same tree, flies and bees. So you're having competition between different guild members. Guilds are groups of species that do the same kind of thing, from, but they're from different taxonomic groups. There's consumptive competition, where one species may better exploit the resources than another. And in terms of bees visiting flowers, those with longer tongues can exploit more resources. Preemptive competition, where one precludes the other. For example, um, extrafloral nectary plants and their homopterans on the same plants exuding honeydew, both are competing for ants. And we'll go down to the bottom of this list. On plants receiving pollen from pollinators, Pollen from the wrong species of plant might clog the stigma, preventing the plant's own pollen from being able to pollinate. And there can be mutualism for mutualists, too, where high densities of mutualists might promote more interactions. Instead of a single flower or two hoping to attract a visitor, Many plants blooming at the same time may benefit from greater visitation. The same with many species fruiting at the same time, or many individuals of the same species in a population. Just like there was apparent competition, that we can have indirect facilitation, where one competitor can have a beneficial effect on a competitor because it's competing with another competitor. An example of this could be a plant and bird mutually facilitative to each other because the caterpillar that eats the plant is eaten by the bird. So the bird benefits the tree indirectly. Or think about krill, the little animals in the ocean eaten by whales during times when people hunted whales, a barbaric, horrible thing, but then whale numbers were decreased, so the krill benefited. Here's a picture of some ants tending scale insects, 
The scale insects are these green round things. This one is called Coccus viridis, the green scale. Exuding honeydew, the ants are collecting it. So I want to end with these ant plant homopteran examples. In the simplest scenario, A, the homopteran benefits from the plant, but it harms the plant, sucking its sap. So the ant tending the homopteran benefits the homopteran, the homopteran benefits the ant, but indirectly, and that's the dotted line here, the ant harms the plant by tending the homopteran on the plant. In B, it might be that although um, all those other interactions are the same, because the ant may uh, attack other herbivores that eat the plant, which are harmful to the plant, it could indirectly benefit the plant. But in another iteration complication, there might be herbivores that are harming the plant, and the ant may chase away natural enemies of those herbivores, like that harm the, the other herbivore, parasitoids of the herbivores. So in that way, may indirectly benefit that other herbivore and thereby indirectly harm the plant. So these things are concatenating and can be very complicated, to me very interesting.